share uh, this this video in in the chat. Um, but hopefully you, some of you can find that helpful. And this is something that we sell. In fact, we just got a bunch of these in, um, and you can order them through our website. All right, so uh, Derek, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Um, why don't you tell us tell us what uh, how you like to start your sessions? Thanks. So I I actually tend to start my sessions um, with um, some movement. So I'll. Um, I'll do some movement to promote extension and um, get myself into uh, an alert mo uh, an alert mode. Basically, get my mind into a place that's ready to play. Uh, and to do that, I have found that I really need to be sitting in the right kind of chair. I'm six two, but I also have legs that are very very long compared to my torso so if i sit down next to someone who's like half a foot shorter than me i will still be the same height or shorter while sitting and all of the extra length is in my legs so i find it's really really essential to use a cheer that is adjustable i'm gonna adjust my mic here i'm seeing i'm a little soft and Okay, I should be good now. Um, so what I use is a drum throne. Now, don't ask me why drum players get to have thrones. Well, everyone else has a chair. But this is a rock and sock drum throne. It's on a gas cylinder, so it's fully adjustable. Um, it's a saddle seat, so what that does is it promotes placing my legs into a more um, stable, advantageous position, so closer to being at a right angle rather than trying to, uh, instead of trying to hold my legs closed like this, a more comfortable right angle, and it, and it also just per it promotes um, a bit of movement because I like the fact that the cheer is not is not steady. I, I not only have one of these in my office, I have a foldable version that I will take with me on longer trips. So I play in the Amarillo Symphony and when I do that, I'm usually gone for five or six days at a time. And so when I do that, I will take my foldable rock and sock um, drum throne with me. And that's because it's truly that important for me to have a good place to sit. It helps me promote my breathing more. It helps me to just practice more. When I practice in a chair that's too short and I'm cutting off my breathing and I'm not able to sit in a correct manner, it makes me more tired than I usually would be. And it makes me a lot less alert. I end up more likely to just go through the motions instead of practicing in a really, um, really secure manner. Um, I also use a visualizer, just like Mark. So I actually use it in a different way. So what um, I will do is I take the visualizer and I take a straw and I put the straw through the visualizer and I do this exercise. So the straw is just blocked off at one end and then I'm using. And what that does is it promotes a more open aperture and also by focusing on the sound of the straw, it helps me to make sure I'm starting every single note with fast air. Because I don't want that 
kind of sound. I want a sound that starts right away. But yeah, that's how I start off my practice sessions. Um, so Mark, uh, do you use a tuner or a metronome at all when you're practicing? Yes, I do. Um, I find those tools really indispensable. And in fact, um, I have uh, probably more use for a metronome on a regular basis than I do a tuner. Uh, my preferred metronome is actually, um, at this time, it's actually just the Tonal Energy app, right, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. I know there's some folks that prefer to use a dedicated metronome uh, rather than an app, and I totally get that. That makes sense. For me, it's just handy enough that it's right there. It's what I usually reach for, uh, and it's kind of set up in a way that um, uh, all of my sort of defaults um, are, are, are there. So um, I find it's pretty, you know, it has enough, like, sort of parameters that you can really design any sort of subdivisions uh, that you need. Um, so I've never run into an issue where it didn't, it, it wasn't helpful in some way. Um, so uh, yeah, the Tonal Energy app, that's also got some other great elements to it. I haven't explored as much the other parts of that app, but it's, it's pretty impressive. This is the one that you pay for, not just the free version. And it's like, I don't know, not expensive, but um, it's definitely been worth the investment investment for me. Um, as far as a tuner goes, um, I really like these Peterson Strobo Clip tuners. And uh, I feel that uh, they are just really handy to clip onto your horn or your lead pipe. Um, they are tuning off the, as far as I understand, they're tuning off the vibration that you're creating. So they're not gonna pick up other noise or other people in the room. Um, so it's very direct and it's very specific to, to your playing. Uh, so I find that really helpful. Sometimes in ensembles, you have to be careful. It can rub people the wrong way if you're using a tuner. I get that, right? So uh, be careful about when you deploy this, it's probably a better tool for your individual practice session than it is to bring into work. Um, although on certain, in certain moments I have, I have brought it with me mainly just so that I know sort of that I'm staying in my lane pitch wise and that has been helpful. It's almost surprising to me how much, uh, how it can be difficult to, here, especially depending on the acoustic and where you are on stage, sometimes I can't tell if I'm if I'm out of tune or in tune with other voices. Um, and in those moments, maybe it's a really big work, maybe we're in a strange part of the stage. In those moments, I like to have this guy in my case just to check to check in and see where I am. But uh, yeah, as far as as far as tuners go, um, this is this is a great one, and it won't break the bank. It runs on these small batteries and uh, you can pack it up, take it anywhere. Pretty great. Yeah, I also, I have a struggle clip that I use um, mainly before rehearsals. Um, I don't use it ever uh, during rehearsals. As Mark said, if you're ever in a situation, like if you're just out taking a gig or um, subbing somewhere or um, basically in a situation where your continued employment is completely at, uh, you know, at the contractor's whim or the principal's whim, um, don't do it because you're gonna piss somebody off. Uh, if you're using a tuner while playing, someone's not gonna like it. Uh, uh, and speaking of that, I would say that about the next practice tool that I use all the time and that's, um, my iPad. Now, those of you who follow me on social media know that I'm a big fan of using um, iPads, not only to read my music when practicing, but reading my music when um, rehearsing and um, 
and performing. Frankly, I think it's just much using an iPad and then using a, a pedal to turn pages is a much better and more efficient solution to um, bad page turns. I like being able to use multiple color markings when I'm writing things down in my uh, in my music. It helps to draw my attention to them more than um, a pencil mark on a yellowish sheet of uh, on a yellowish sheet of paper. Um, however, I only use the iPad when I'm playing in jobs that I have. <laughs> I don't use the iPad when I'm playing somewhere that um, someone might see it and they might get scared and like, well, what if that thing runs out of batteries? What if it crashes? What if this? What if that? You know, th that kind of thing. So some people might be very, very sensitive to that. So just if you're going to use an iPad um, during a rehearsal or performance, be aware of that. Um, as far as tuners and metronomes are concerned, I, just like Mark, use the Tonal Energy Tuner as my um, main metronome. And I use that in conjunction with a Bluetooth speaker. I use the JBL Flip 5. It's a more, uh, more expensive um, Bluetooth speaker, but for its size, it has a really, really big sound. So if I want to just crank the metronome up, this allows me to, to really crank it up to the point where I'm not going to be able to play over it. And that goes for um, when I'm playing with a drone as well. For my uh, drone um, generator, I don't use Tonal Energy Tuner because I can't stand any of the default tones. Uh, I usually like to play to like a sh strings or a, a cello backing. Um, and I know Tonal Energy Tuner does have a cello backing, but it's honestly to me it sounds like one of the fakest cellos in the world. <laughs> to the point where it's distracting. But the Four Score app, which is the app that I use for reading my music and reading my exercises, has a great built-in drone generator as well. And I use the string setting and it sounds much more like a realistic cello than uh, Tonal Energy Tuner's uh, drone uh, generator. And as far as my general tuning, I like strobe tuners. So I use the Peterson Strobel Plus uh, HD. Uh, this is one of the items we're talking about today that you can find at HowltonHorns.com. Uh, the uh, Peterson Strobel Plus uh, HD, it has a nice uh, bright backlit screen. So again, it's, it's not, doesn't strain me to see it at all. I'm able to um, see it right away. Um, Peterson does make a Strobo tuning app for iPad and iPhone. It works okay, but I don't like it nearly as much as just the separate uh, device. And what I like about strobe tuning is something about the motion of the wheel going back and forth really helps you to it's easier to see at a glance if you're flat or sharp rather than looking at a needle and trying to see, okay, how far is it tilting one way? How far is it tilting the other way? Uh, that instant motion is just easier to see. Um, the clip-on tuner that Mark was talking about is also a, a strobe tuner. I don't know. I, I've actually noticed I, there was a time when every single band room had a strobe tuner in it. And when I was growing up and I was in high school band, there was this big, like, $6,000 strobe tuner sitting in the corner. I don't see it much in band halls anymore. I don't know if they disappeared or they're just not used in Texas. I grew up in Chicago, so that's, uh, that's my band experience. And I do know Peterson is based in Allsip, Illinois, which is uh, about 10 minutes from where I grew up. Uh, but yeah, that's what I use for... You know, tuning and um, metronome. Remember, if you're auditioning anywhere, the main things anyone is looking for are rhythm, intonation, and style. And a tuner, metronome, and drone can help you with two out of the three. Speaking of the third, Mark, do you, what do you use for recording yourself? Depends. Um... It kind of depends on what kind of recording I'm doing. So if I'm going to record a project or record for 
is, let's say if I was going to submit something for an audition uh, or something of that nature, I, um, I would use, you know, higher end microphones uh, that I have here in my studio. And those are a pretty recent acquisition. Uh, that's more of a pandemic uh, project, actually. And uh, I'm slowly figuring out how to use that stuff. But in general, I think the, the immediate feedback uh, a lot of it can be gained just by using a, a voice memo recorder or an MP3 recorder. I mean, we're all carrying around or, a smartphone these or days MP3 or recorder. 90, probably 98% of us, right? So to have uh, an iPad, you know, or a smartphone that has a voice memo or some version of an MP3 recording format, uh, it's, it's so easy to just press record. And just get a sense on an excerpt or part of an etude or a piece what you sound like right it's uh it's so objective and there's really no excuse so i would say rather than uh be ultra concerned with the quality of your recording equipment just uh use the basics uh that you have at hand to improve uh your knowledge of of what's going on you know that feedback that playback uh, will not lie to you, right? It's it's brutally honest in some cases, but it uh, it really is a great teacher, right? So I think that's extremely important. I just want to talk quickly. I want to come back to tuners real quick, and I'm glad Derek mentioned what he did about the strobe uh, as opposed to the needle, because uh, I think it's it's helpful also to use that strobe or the virtual strobe uh, as a, I don't know, as more of a guide to show us whether we're going in the right direction or in the ballpark with pitch. Because like, let's be honest, we can talk about um, pitch all day long. Um, we wanna know that we're in the ballpark, right? Because our pitch might change depending on what chord member we're playing in an ensemble or the certain scale degree that we're on in a given phrase, right? So pitch is not necessarily this static thing. It's, you know, um, like a piano is tuned, right? Like, like we're not, we're not, um, we're not going to have that same calibration, right? Uh, as brass players and every instrument uh, is going to have tendencies. Every horn that I've ever played has different tendencies and different registers and on different notes. So getting to know those tendencies and living with them uh, is something that a tuner can help with. Uh, so that if you know sort of what direction you're going and what direction you need to go to maybe counter that in a given situation, that's really important. I would just encourage people to think more generally uh, in terms of, you know, if we're talking about like a, like a strobe or a virtual strobe, you'll see this strobe spinning one direction and that could just kind of tells you like hey maybe i can slow it down a little bit and you know we would never expect anyone to stop the strobe on every single note um and i think that it that that's if if we had that it would you know it would sound a little bit robotic and in some ways it wouldn't wouldn't work as well but um so anyway that's a long that's a long explanation about why I like the the strobe type tuners and yes I think there's fewer of them now but they they were really popular and they're very old school the the original ones they were super expensive now that Peterson has this technology in a virtual format I think that's just taken over because it's much more accessible to to many more people um sorry Derek I just went off talking about did I answer your question I don't know. Yeah, I think you did. Okay. Um, what are we on to next here? So, so uh, first, let me talk a little bit uh, about um, my recording devices. Actually, first, I also wanted to show this uh, little Bose Bluetooth speaker. This is what I use to travel with, you know, just because it's much smaller than this JBL speaker. And although um, I haven't been traveling much due to the pandemic, before the pandemic, I was on this kick to really lighten up um, my travel pack and how much stuff I was carrying and dragging along with me. So having a smaller Bluetooth speaker uh, helped with that. 
The Bose is really loud. The only problem with it is that the battery doesn't last as long as um, uh, my other Bluetooth speaker. Uh, and by the way, this is the pedal that I use with my iPad. It is the AirTurn Duo BT-106. Uh, you definitely want the um, pedal with more mechanical uh, uh, with, with more mechanical pedals. There's another one that's flatter, smaller, easier to carry. Um, but I, I've heard so many um, issues of, uh, of problems with that one. I wouldn't do it. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna use an iPad and you're gonna use a pedal, you need something that's super reliable. The last thing you need to be doing is in a performance hitting the pedal and nothing turns. <laughs> that that's kind of unacceptable. But that one has served me well with no issues whatsoever. Uh, part of my travel kit is also my little recorder here. This is a Zoom H5. The Zoom H5, I think, uh, uh, Zoom makes a lot of different recorders. There's the H1, the H2, um, the H4, which was very popular for a while. Um, there's the H6, but the H5, has a great combination of small size so it's not the smallest recorder out there but this is clearly this is small enough to get in um you know in your briefcase or i when i'm traveling i use the marcus bona backpack bag which is seriously one of the greatest cases ever made available at houghtonhorns.com but I, I say that with no reservations whatsoever the mb backpack bag more people need to be using it you can fit your horn in it, you can fit a mute, you can fit so many other things in it. It's the perfect travel case. Like, it is the case everyone should have. Um, and I don't get, I see lots of cases. I don't get that excited about a case that often, but MB backpack bag, amazing. Uh, sorry for that tangent, but it fits in the, in the backpack bag or whatever bag you're using really easily. It even has lots of extra functionality. So for example, the, uh, the microphones are removable, so I could take the XY stereo mics off and I could uh, change that to a mid-side microphone if I wanted a different um, sound. Or a shotgun microphone. I have a shotgun microphone that I've used when uh, recording different events that Houghton Horns puts on. So I can take this, take off the XY, put on a shotgun mic, uh, put it at the back of the room, and the shotgun mic will um, pick up the sound of whoever's talking quite well. Not that you need that for practicing, but it's a nice functionality to have if you're going to invest 200 bucks in a recorder. Um, and then when I'm at home, I just use my home recording setup, which is far more than anybody needs, but I've kind of, um, I've been into recording for many years now. So I have a AEA uh, R88 uh, stereo ribbon mic uh, connected to uh, Macintosh. Uh, and um, on that Mac, I run uh, Pro Tools. So I record into Pro Tools. I record all my practice sessions um, every minute of it. So I just start off that practice session. I start off my recording at the beginning of my practice session. And I do that because I find there are many things I play and I immediately say, wow, I wanna hear what I just did back. Not because it was that good, normally because it was that bad. <laughs> And I need to try to figure out, okay, what went wrong here? Um, how do I avoid it? Or did that really sound as good as I thought it did? And oftentimes, no. But it's good to have that instant feedback. Okay, I can stop the recording. Let me go back, listen to what I just did. Okay, no, that those articulations didn't sound great. This is way too heavy, way heavier than I thought it was. Let me go back in and fix that. It's that sort of thing. Um, moving on from there, like, what about your practice space, Mark? Like, um, have you, do you have, I talked about my rock and sock drum throne here, which I love, and I wish it wasn't called a drum throne because I think any musician could use it. Uh, do you have anything special in your practice space that helps you to get the most out of your practice sessions? Yeah, I mean, basically... The, the biggest element for me is just having a studio that I can, you know, room where I can close the door uh, and sort of filter out the distractions. So that's that's really key for me. I know that not everybody uh, is going to have access to that, but finding that place where you can get work done is super important. Uh, beyond that, let's see, I'm going to turn the lights on here. They have a 
motion sensor. You can see I've got a lot of acoustic treatment, which helps. Uh, I've got a fan in here, an air purifier. I'm able to crack a window, which is nice. Uh, I've got a piano, which is uh, sort of, you can see part of it here. It's kind of off screen. Uh, all of my music is stored here. So it makes it, I guess, and, and basically you can see the chair and stand behind me. That's basically permanently set up. So the nice thing about having a dedicated space is being able to set it up so that you really have very little excuse, right? Like you can come in and easily begin practicing just at the drop of a hat. So um, I really don't have excuses to not practice because the room is completely set up for me to do just that. Um, so I would suggest whatever your situation is, find a place that you can sort of find your nook, find your find your nook or cranny, right? And and just set it up so that uh, you can jump right in. It's not really, really just a lesson for life in general though. If you want yeah. to do something, reduce the barriers to doing it. Uh, like you guys have noticed that um, these live streams have been uh, going on on a regular basis for several weeks now. And the main reason is because in my studio, I set up a permanent live stream setup. So when I want to start a live stream, it's just getting the software straight for 10 to 15 minutes instead of an hour of let me get the camera out of my closet. Let me put the camera on the tripod. Let me set up the light. Let me hook up the cables. Let me do this. Let me do that. That makes you not want to do things. Um, so True. I made it so that it's accessible. I can do it right away. It, it's not a big deal. I have a practice, a basic a permanent practice set up behind me. When I want to practice, I get my horn off the wall. I don't even keep my horns in a, in a case. I uh, use ladder hooks, which we uh, used to use um, at our old shop to hang up horns. Um, and when we stopped, we just had um, several hundred ladder hooks available. So <laughs> I helped myself to a few and um, I hang up all my horns on the wall. I don't have to put it together. I just pick it up off the wall. I sit down, I start playing, no barriers. I, I would recommend everyone to go, uh, to go for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, did you have anything else you wanted to uh, talk about as far as your tools are concerned, Mark? Yeah, just a couple more things. Um, I have uh, going to pull back real quick to other Bluetooth speaker options. This is a really, this is uh, an Anchor uh, Soundcore speaker. I got it on uh, Amazon. It's not super expensive. It has an incredibly long battery life. Um, I... I really, I can count on like one hand the number of times I've had to charge it. It's nuts. I don't know how they, the battery lasts that long. I use it primarily just for uh, drone work. And uh, having, if you're going to play with drones, uh, back to the drone thing, it's really important to have a Bluetooth speaker that can crank out the sound uh, pr in a healthy way so that you, you're not, eclipsing the drone when you start to play and then you can play it you know at a high dynamic with the drone if that's what uh you you want to do um so you don't have to spend a fortune but get a quality bluetooth speaker right don't don't get the cheapest thing available because you will probably drown it out and it won't be that helpful um so uh the other thing that i like about drones and uh and i know i'm kind of taking a step back but I think it's really important accountability right for pitch awareness right awareness of where you are right uh, playing simple things like scales with a drone can really give you a sense of of where you're fitting in what the tendencies on your instrument are i think in some ways it's a lot better in some ways than having a tuner because that's a more reactive uh i don't know it's 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 a different sort of skill uh, when you're playing with a drone, you're using the same skills that you would use in an ensemble to adjust to pitch. So I think it's really important to to develop those skills on your own with a, with a drone playing. Um, also, something that is really crucial right now, a lot of us can't play in larger groups or can't play with other people in real time. Drones are awesome uh, during this time because they don't 
it's, there's no substitute right for playing with other people in a in an ensemble or a group but the drone is comes close right to to making it feel like you're not alone and it actually is a huge sometimes if i'm feeling like unmotivated if i turn on a drone and just start playing simple melodies with the drone it get it gets me going it, it's 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 inspiring and and it gets me into a practice mode uh, that I can sustain for a little while. So I, if you haven't uh, made that a regular part of your uh, practice arsenal, having the having the drone and the Bluetooth ready to go is huge. It's been huge for me. And uh, it doesn't just stop with drones. It can be, you know, you could put on iTunes or Spotify and play along with other music, anything to get, sometimes just to get what I call FaceTime, just to get the horn on your face, especially during this, time where we have very few opportunities to do it i'm going to close out the last thing that i have well i have a couple more things but i think the next thing that uh i want to talk about is the <clears throat> incentive spirometer so some of you have probably seen these guys um gail williams is really big on this tool and the way that the way that I use it, and the way she uses it, if you actually turn it upside down, it's actually a medical device. It's a breathing uh, device. Um, and I've heard that they're actually in short supply right now uh, because of COVID. It's very interesting. But if you can get your hands on one, uh, it's really great. Uh, I use it generally like I plug the mouthpiece into this end, right? And you can see that there's a little gauge here and there's a ball that uh, responds to the amount of air that you're, uh, th that's flowing into the device. So I kind of like to check, I, I like to check my articulation and my uh, sense of uh, sustained air with this guy. <laughs> so you can kind of see there, um, What's nice is that you get this visual and um, uh, tactile connection with your articulation and with your air. Uh, it's really fantastic. If I'm not into my articulation, which happens often, uh, especially in a given passage, uh, or if I feel like maybe uh, I've got to get my air going uh, in terms of immediacy of response or different dynamics. I go to this guy, it's sitting right on my, it's sitting right next to my stand most of the time. So it's nice to pick it up and kind of see, it's a good gauge. It kind of tells me where I am. Um, it's great. I use it as a teaching tool. Of course, these days, probably not the greatest thing to share uh, with your students because COVID, uh, but um, I would encourage, um, I would encourage students to look into it. It's been really helpful for me. Uh, and then I'll just finish off real quickly. The last thing, this is a little outside the box. And I thought about, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to even share this, but this is a little pitch pipe. It comes with like a lot of times with, in a, with a mandolin or a, a violin case or something. Uh, it's really basic. In fact, this is from one of my daughter's violin uh, cases, but I, I find it kind of helpful for a couple of reasons one just to connect with pitch right and also uh just to get the sense of the way that this is created right the vibration uh that creates these pitches there's a little reed in there essentially that's vibrating and to get it started, I don't know how clear that's coming through on the stream, but there's this moment when the vibration, it's like, it sort of gets willed into existence, right? And it's very easy to do because it, it requires no skill to blow into this thing. But I try and relate my my attacks, my starts of notes to this uh, sort of really simplistic tool. And I think the, the goal is to 
replicate the ease in which that vibration starts. Um, so it might be worth uh, checking this out. Harmonicas are very similar. So if you have a harmonica, it's kind of the same sort of deal. Um, but I think it's worth exploring. It's helped me out. And when I think about efficiency and production, uh, sometimes I go back to this guy. And just to remind me how easy it can be and how easy that vibration, you know, again, with with the impetus being the air that's always guiding us. Uh, but I, I try and look for that uh, sort of the breath attack uh, out of nothing start and the, the tapered releases. And it's nice to review that with this little tool here. So that's all I got. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to give it back to Derek, but uh, apparently we all need to buy the uh, MB backpack case. You know, that's, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you're that crazy about it and, and you're a, an equipment guy for sure, so you would know. But. <laughs> well, at the very least, I am, I am a case guy. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to point out as a practice tool is just a practice mute. But not using a practice mute just to lower the volume of your practicing. Using a practice mute as a tool um, to increase efficiency. Uh, this doesn't apply to every practice mute, but it definitely applies to the Yamaha Silent Brass. And my favorite practice mute, which is the uh, uh, up mute, I did a video about that a few weeks ago. Um, in fact, the only reason I'm not showing you the up mute now is because the up mute is in my case where it should be, where I can take it, uh, take it to different places. Um, but using a practice mute for efficiency. When I hear of people playing the up mute or playing the Yamaha a Silent Brass, and they tell me there's just too much back pressure, there's just too much back pressure. Uh, a lot of times, it's not that there's too much back pressure in the mute, it's that you're using too much energy to play. Now again, this doesn't apply to every mute. A lot of practice mutes are just bad <laughs> and they do just have a ton of back pressure. But a good practice mute, um, you want to play it with only enough energy to produce the sound without blowing against the virtual wall that you feel when you put too much air into the instrument. And you'll find if you practice with a practice mute like that for a few minutes, on some scales or long tones or things like that and then you move it back to the horn you'll get this nice big free open sound with a lot less energy it's really a tool to help you to do less that's been my mantra for the entire pandemic and that's what i've been personally learning as a player through the entire pandemic do less when you face a problem it's not do more it's not you know, it's not always, sometimes it is, but it's not always like, you know, aim higher, um, use more muscle, you know, use more air and more air and more air. A lot of times it's back off and let it happen. You're standing in the way of this note happening. You're standing in the way of this interval happening. You're standing in the way of playing this with a clear sound. Back off and let it happen. Um, as far as practice tools, I think that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you again for joining us for this live stream. I know viewership was um, a bit a, a bit lower than normal because of our <laughs> technical issues at the beginning. Right where we were going to start the stream, my audio mixing software crashed. So I had to restart my computer, set up things again. Um, but thank you for bearing with us. Um, but this video will be up in its entirety in case you wanna um, see it again, learn more about the practice tools that we use. Um, if you didn't leave a comment uh, during the video, feel free to leave a comment anytime um, afterwards. I read them all. Uh, I get email notifications every time there's a comment made on these videos. So I read them and I, and I try to respond to all of them. So if you have a question about the tools we use or anything me and Mark uh, talked about um, otherwise, or really even if you just have a, a question about playing horn or horns in general, 
you know, we would love to answer them. That's why we're here. Right, right Mark? Because, I mean, we love, we love horn. We Most we, of the time. Yeah. <laughs> we love playing. We love talking about it. We love talking about equipment. We love talking about music. We love talking about performances and other performers. We just like talking about about it. So any any questions about it, just leave a comment on the video and we'll uh, get back to you. Um, Lasky mouthpieces are available on HoutonHorns.com. They're in pre-order status, but we expect to see them sometime in the next week or two. Um, supply, uh, demand will outstrip supply. So if you're interested, be sure you place your order in now. MB backpack case, best case ever made. Okay, one of the best cases ever made. And we'll see you again next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, oh, okay. I ended Facebook. But I see there's a question in YouTube chat. So this is going to be an this is going to be an answer to YouTube. I have which what practice mute is the best while being budget friendly. Hmm. So obviously uh, the budget friendly practice mute that we sell is the uh, is the fax practice mute. Um, the fax practice mute is uh, around sixty dollars. I don't remember its exact price. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of the fax practice mute because. I think number one, it's loud for a practice mute. I think the primary, the primary thing you want out of a practice mute is the fact that it muffles your sound. Um, the fax practice mute to me starts to get close to uh, just a metal straight mute. Um, but that is the budget option. Once you get to the up mute, you're already at like $130, $140. And frankly, I think that's just what you need to be prepared to spend to find a good practice mute. I'm sorry. I wish I could recommend something that was a, a lot cheaper and that would, um, you know, and that would fill the bill. But I, I do think you do have, currently, you have to get up to the price of, of the up mute to really get a quality practice mute. Um, where can I get the medical ball instrument? Mark, you want to take that question? Um... I believe Czech Hickey's music, and I believe they're in um, Ithaca, New York. Now, sometimes they're out of stock. I'm not sure. That's something that we're going to look into carrying as well. Um, but like I said, they might be in short supply because of uh, because of the very real pandemic we're, we're dealing with. And this is a medical device that deals with respiratory therapy. So don't be shocked if they're not super readily available right now. But check Hickey's and check Amazon. I mean, the, the, the exact name is an incentive spirometer and it's made by Portex Incorporated. P-O-R-T-E-X. So searching for that should, should turn up something. So uh, again, sorry we're not carrying it currently, but I think that it's still worth checking out. All right, I hope all of that answered uh, your question. And we'll see you again next week. There will be a live stream on uh, Tuesday at noon and uh, hopefully another one on Friday as well. Uh, we'll see you then. Actually, Mark, are you going to be in town? You're going to be in town on Friday, right? Is that your performance day? Yeah. I'm not sure about my schedule quite quite mm -hmm. yet. but. Well, hey, maybe we could do one in person. Maybe so. Together. <laughs> All right. I will talk to you later. And bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everybody.